So I wanted to bring a little woman power to the evening. So my obvious first thoughts were Janis Joplin or Patti Smith. And then my research led me to Ronnie Spector. And she was a singer in the Ronettes. And she is now considered the first bad girl of rock and roll because her band was the first to wear heavy black makeup and hike their skirts up, cut slits up the side. So the Ronettes, not very metal, but this is where it all started for us women. Her book is called Be My Baby, How I Survived Mascara, Miniskirts, and Madness. <laughs> so uh, she starts off talking about Murray and Marie K. Kaufman was like the big radio DJ at the time. Uh, Murray first put us on the bill at the Brooklyn Fox for a springtime review in 1962. Actually, we weren't exactly on the bill, at least not as the Ronettes. He only put the top 10 or 12 acts up on the marquee, so we were one of the acts listed under and others. For those first few shows, Murray didn't even introduce us as the Ronettes. When he brought us out on stage, he called us his beautiful dancing girls which is pretty much all we were at first. Murray also used us as background singers for all the acts that couldn't sing real well. After a while, he even started letting us do one or two numbers on our own. We do twist and shout or what I'd say, anything as long as it had a fast tempo that we could dance to. That was the key, because the more we shook our behinds and our tight skirts, the louder the kids would applaud. It was during these shows that the Ronette's image was really born. My mother always told us to look for a gimmick that would make us stand out from all the other groups, something that made us different. Well, being half-breeds, uh, they were, it's her, her sister, and her cousin that were in the band, and her mom was black and Cherokee, and her dad was white. Uh, so she says, well, being half-breeds, we were born different. So we figured the thing that set us apart from the other groups was our look. And sitting around for hours on end in our dressing room with the Brooklyn Fox, we had plenty of time to work on our look. There was nothing back there but mirrors, chairs, and makeup. So we naturally passed the time trying on different looks. Estelle would grab an eyebrow pencil and say, let's extend our eyeliner. Then the three of us would have a little contest to see who could extend her eyeliner the farthest. Mm. Then we'd start in on the lashes. We'd all lay mascara on until our eyelashes were out to here. Then Nedra would grab a rat tail comb and run to the mirror shouting, let's tease our hair. She'd tease her hair until she could stack it about three feet on top of her head. Then, of course, Estelle and I would try and top her. We looked pretty wild by the time we got out on stage, and the kids loved it. They'd clap and make noise as soon as they saw us walk out. And the louder they applauded, the more mascara we'd put on the next time. <laughs> we didn't have a hit record to grab their attention, so we had to make an impression with our style. None of it was planned out. We just took the look we were born with and extended it. A lot of people have commented that the Ronettes looked Chinese. Maybe we did, but it wasn't conscious. We never tried to look like any other race. If we copied anything, it was the look of the girls we'd see on the streets of Spanish Harlem. The eyeliner and teased hair. That's what we saw when we grew up, so we brought it to our act. Of course, we exaggerated on stage because everything on stage has to be bigger than life. But when people ask me where the Ronettes got their street image, I always tell them we got it from the streets. We may have looked like street girls, but I think the audience could tell that under all that makeup, we were really just three innocent teenagers. And I think they liked that combination. The girls loved us because we were different. We followed our own style and didn't care what anybody thought. And the boys liked us for obvious reasons. The Ronettes were what the girls wanted to be and what the guys dreamed about. So when the audience started responding to our street look, we played along. The songs we sang were already tougher than the stuff the other groups did. While the Shirelles sang about their soldier boy, we were telling the guys, turn on your love light. We weren't afraid to be hot. That was our gimmick. When we saw the Shirelles walk on stage in their wide party dresses, we went in the opposite direction and squeezed our bodies into the tightest skirts we could find. Then we'd get out on stage and hike them up to show our legs even more. After a while, it got to be so much trouble hiking these skirts up that we finally just cut slits up the side. That was the Ronettes look, and we definitely made an impact. After our first engagement at the Brooklyn Fox, Murray could see our popularity growing. I mean, to have no hit records and still have kids waiting backstage to tear our clothes off made it pretty obvious that we had something special. That's when Murray started using us on the radio show every night.
We spent most of 1962 waiting for one of our records to hit. It was a long wait. After What's So Sweet About Sweet Sixteen flopped on Cole Picks, Stu Phillips put our next two records out on May Records, which was Cole Picks's Rhythm and Blues label. But it didn't seem to matter what label they were on. Nobody was buying our records, period. I'm Gonna Quit While I'm Ahead didn't sell any better than our first single. We couldn't figure out why our stuff wasn't selling, but listening to those songs today, I can see why they didn't make it. Cole Picks had no idea what to do with us. Stu Phillips just didn't know what rock and roll was. I mean, he had us in the studio backed up by two fake McGuire sisters. And with the strange songs he picked for us, it's no surprise our recording career was going nowhere. Thank God for the Brooklyn Fox. Hit or no hit, that audience made us feel like stars. And by now, Murray booked us on every show he did at the Fox. I still have a program for one of the shows we did a couple years later, in September of 1964, when the artists included Shangri-Las, Marvin Gaye, The Miracles, The Supremes, Martha and the Vandellas, The Contours, The Temptations, The Searchers, Jay and the Americans, The Davels, Little Anthony and the Imperials, and The New Beats. All that in a movie for $2.50. Can you believe it? Of course, we didn't get along with everybody. I couldn't stand the Shirelles when we were just starting out. They were the headliners and they didn't want to have anything to do with the other groups. Boy, they were stuck up. The Shirelles were the only girl group with their own valet. I mean, to have a valet, you had to be superstars, and they sure thought they were. These girls would not even come out of their dressing room until they were ready to go on stage, and then they hardly spoke to you. They just walked straight out to the stage with their ballet waiting in the wings. The Shirelles looked at us like we were little nothings. I just said, well, gee. Dusty Springfield was another one I'll never forget. She shared a dressing room with us once, and I never saw anyone get so frustrated backstage. She hated being stuck back there all day and night, and she expressed her frustration with dishes. <laughs> All the dressing rooms opened out into this long hallway, and at the end of this hall was a big exit door that led to the stage. When Dusty Springfield got upset, she would go out to the hallway and throw cups and saucers at the stage door. By the second show, you had to step over piles of broken china just to get to the stage. After she broke every dish in the place, she'd send her valet out to Lamison's 5 and 10 cent store to buy more. This poor guy would come back with a whole box of white cups and saucers for Dusty Springfield to throw at the exit door. She'd break dishes for five minutes and she'd walk back into the dressing room with a big smile on her face. I guess it helped relieve her tension, but we all thought she was nuts. I never could understand the craziness of some performers. Rock and roll came so naturally to me. I didn't understand what all the fuss and frustration was about.